All right, end time events, future events, certainly exciting things to look forward to for us as Christians. We spent six weeks on one topic, the thing we're looking for right now. What is that? The rapture, we call it, the time when Jesus comes back in the clouds and catches all of his people out of this earth to meet him in the air and ever be with the Lord. And we looked at a whole bunch of areas in the world, predicting the Bible. Things are setting up for the time after the rapture called the tribulation time. And so with that going into place, we know the rapture certainly is drawing close. We're moving on now. What happens after the rapture, first of all, to Christians who go to heaven? What is going to happen to Christians who go to heaven? Now, here's our chart. And over on this side here, you'll see the church age ends with the rapture of the church and the upgoing there of saints to heaven. And across the very top are the things we're looking at tonight, events in heaven once we get there. First is going to be all the believers of this church age. When we talk about the church age, that's the age that started after Jesus was here. The church officially started on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was given to begin convicting men of sin and convicting their hearts and regenerating them, bringing about salvation to people. So for 2,000 years, we've had the church age going. The church age believers are rewarded at the judgment seat of Christ. We'll look at that this evening. Following which, there will be a marriage of the church to Christ in heaven. We'll look at that also this evening. So those are the two items to look at tonight. And uh, were you able to get the other, uh, other one up there, Kent? Okay, we'll see if it gets another picture for you in a minute. But let's take our Bibles as we begin. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. 2 Corinthians 5. And here we find this very mention of this judgment seat of Christ. Notice at the beginning of chapter 5, Paul is speaking here and talking about Christians. He says, for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Who's the we? His readers, the Corinthian church, and himself. Christians is who he's talking about here. When we come down to verse 10, here's what he reminds them of. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. So here's the judgment seat of Christ. Literally in the Greek, it's called the Bema seat. Now that has bearing on how this particular judgment takes place. The Bema seat in the time of the New Testament was a place where athletes were rewarded in the contest that they had in Greece. Of course, from Greece comes what games? The Olympic Games. So the Bema seat was there for the Olympic Games. What happened was they had a raised platform. Each contestant who won a category would come up on that platform and be rewarded for the contest he had won be given a medal or whatever it was they gave back then for that particular contestant. So the thinking is, since Paul uses that term, it's going to be similar for us. The Lord is going to have a judgment seat in heaven, and each Christian will pass before him to be rewarded. Now, let's stop right there a moment. Rewarded for what? Is this a judgment to determine whether you're going to heaven or not? No, it's not. These are all Christians who appear here. You're definitely in heaven if you're born again. When the Lord takes you up to heaven in the rapture, you're not going to be cast out. You are there. Now, there's another judgment for all lost people. We'll study that down the line. Anybody know the name of it? 
the great white throne judgment, it's described in Revelation chapter 20. We will study that later down the line. This is a judgment just for Christians. Well, is this a judgment to perhaps purge you of your sins, put you through a purgatory? How do we know that? All right. What's happened to our sins as Christians? They've been washed away. They're under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember 1 John 1, 7, the blood of Jesus Christ keeps on cleansing us from all sin. So Jesus paid for all of our sin on the cross. We don't have to go to heaven and pay for any sins. In fact, look at Romans chapter number 8. Romans chapter 8. Notice what it says in verse 1. There is therefore now, right now, no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk after the, not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So there's no condemnation for Christians anymore. You don't have to worry about being judged for your sins. Jesus was judged for your sins. Praise the Lord for that. Well, what is this judgment about then? Our works. Let's go to another passage and see this. Go to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. This passage certainly seems to be talking about the judgment of Christians. Notice in verse number 11 of 1 Corinthians 3. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. The foundation of our faith is in Jesus. When you trust him, he's your foundation. But notice verse 12. Now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. Notice building upon Jesus Christ. This is as we live our lives. We are building upon Christ. Well, look at the two types of materials there. Precious things, gold, silver, precious stones, but then rather worthless things, wood, hay, and stubble. What's the difference between them? Well, we'll see in a minute. Verse 13, notice carefully the wording. Every man's what? Work shall be made manifest for the day, and that would have to be the day of the judgment seat of Christ. The day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. So it's a judgment of works, not sins. Look at verse 14. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. See, no one is going to perish at this judgment. Everybody's going to heaven at this judgment. But some people are going to have rewards, and some are going to have a loss of rewards because of how they've lived. Now mentions here two types of building materials that we build our lives upon for the Lord. Precious stones and then wood, hay, stubble. Fire in heaven is going to be applied to that. Now there's a difference of opinion as to what that fire is, whether it's literal fire applied to the works or it mentions in Revelation 1 that the absolute gaze of the Lord Jesus Christ is like a burning fire. Let's look at that. Revelation chapter 1, where he's pictured in all his glory and in his judgment appearance. In Revelation chapter number 1, notice in verse number 13, In the midst of the candlesticks, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, girt about the paps with a golden girdle, his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, here it is, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. So some say that when the Lord Jesus Christ, we appear before him, he's the judge, we appear before him, 
His gaze is just going to get rid of all the works that are no good. And the ones that are worthwhile, gold, silver, and precious stones will come forth. He will see them. He will show them and reward us for them. Now, that's what many think. Because there would be no fire, there would be no burning for us in heaven whatsoever. If there is a literal fire, it's applied to works, not to us. But I think it's a good idea to think it is the gaze of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is like a flaming fire and can discern between what's good and bad in our lives. Second Corinthians 5.10 said that. He's going to check between the good and the evil, isn't he? So he'll see the good works and works that aren't good. Now, again, there's going to be rewards for these works. Well, what kind of rewards does the Lord have for us at this judgment? Well, I believe there's at least five crowns we can be earning. Five crowns are mentioned in, Christians that, uh, in scriptures that a Christian can earn. Let me mention them to you. We won't take too much time on this. First, there's the crown of life. It's found in James chapter 1 and verse number 12. It has to deal with going through trials. When we endure the trials, the Lord's going to give people a crown of life who do that. Now you say, what's enduring uh, trials? Remember James chapter 1? The Lord says we're going to have trials, but we should count it joy when we fall into them because they're doing a work in our life. That work is teaching us experience, experience patience, endurance. God's watching us to see if we're willing to wait on him, endure the things we have to go through, be faithful to him in spite of them. And if we are, he's got this special crown to present to us called the crown of life. Notice in 1 Corinthians 9.27, there's an incorruptible crown. That crown is given to people who basically keep their self under control. The Apostle Paul mentions that crown that he's looking forward to receive, and he says, I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. So that's what it takes to get that crown, to not live for the flesh, but live according to the Spirit doing things that are pleasing to the Lord, showing forth the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, all those things. As they're in our life, the Lord observes that. He has a special crown for those who are living a faithful life to Him, an incorruptible crown. So there's a second one. Then in 1 Thessalonians 2.19, it mentions a crown of rejoicing. There the Apostle Paul says that the Thessalonian Christians he won to the Lord are his crown of rejoicing. So this is often called the soul winner's crown. If you're involved in witnessing and people wind up getting saved because of you, and by the way, there can be a series of people involved in the chain of somebody getting saved. All the way from somebody who faithfully day after day after day prays for somebody to the person who first gives them the gospel, but they don't listen, to the person finally down the road they listen to and accept Christ. All in that chain, I believe, are a part of that soul being saved. And so people who are concerned for souls and will pray for them and will witness to them, God has a special crown for them, the crown of rejoicing. Then there's the crown of righteousness mentioned in 2 Timothy 4, 8. The crown of righteousness. Paul mentions there this crown of righteousness is for those who love his appearing. People who are looking for Jesus to come back. Now, the scriptures tell us what will be true in a person's life if they're looking for Jesus to come back. It's 1 John 3, 3. After talking about Jesus coming back, verse 3 says, He that hath his hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. Someone who's looking for Jesus to return is going to live a righteous, holy life as much as they possibly can for the Lord. God says, I see that. You have a crown of righteousness to earn for living that holy life. 
Finally, there's a crown of glory mentioned in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 4. This seems to be a crown just for those who are preachers. Preachers, pastors, evangelists, those particular folk have the opportunity of receiving the crown of glory. But an interesting side note, just hold your place here a moment in 1 Corinthians 3 and go over to the book of Revelation, if you will, chapter 5. Revelation 5 is a picture of things in heaven. I don't guess we got the exact video up there, did we? It's supposed to be a big throne, a throne and a, I was trying to see if it's on the side over there, but I don't see it. Anyway, <laughs> Revelation chapter 5, please notice, if you will, a scene in heaven. It's picturing all of us up there in the future. But in Revelation chapter 5, I want you to notice what happens to the people who have their crowns. I'm sorry, it's chapter 4, verse 10. Chapter 4, verse 10. The four and twenty elders, I don't have time to talk about them now. Later I'll show you how they are picturing the church. The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. So it seems all the people that gain crowns say, Lord, we couldn't have gotten them without you, which is true. So to give them all the honor and glory, they're going to take those crowns off and cast them at the feet of Jesus. What a wonderful scene that's going to be up there in heaven, giving him all of the glory at that particular time. Now, there's undoubtedly other rewards that people will earn as well up there for heaven. Uh, I don't know what all they might be, but definitely live for Jesus. It is worthwhile. God does not forget anything you do for him. My second life's verse, 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. God sees what you're doing. Now, we could go and mention the fact that God does look at motives in what you're doing. I mean, some people look for the praise of men. That was the Pharisees in Jesus' day. Remember Matthew chapter 6? He came along and said, Pharisees, stand on street corners, blow a trumpet. Doo, 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 doo. I'm about to pray. Everybody watch me and listen now. And they make long flowing prayers to be prayed before men and heard by men. You know what Jesus said about those people? Barely they have their reward. The only reward they're going to get is the reward in this life of the praise of men. They're not getting any praise from God. When we do our serious praying, Jesus said, enter into your prayer closet. Don't let your right hand know what your left hand's doing. You just get down to praying you and me, praying you and me. That's the praying I'm looking for. And so the Lord does look at motives, why people do the things they do, sing, preachers, people that are, you know, being deacons, people that serve in other capacities. Are we doing it for, great job. You're wonderful. You're great. Wow, fantastic. Is that what we're looking for? Praise of men or praise of God? A verse that enters into this is 1 Corinthians 4. I told you to hold your place in 1 Corinthians 3, but just over in 1 Corinthians 4, look at verse 5. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. God sees what's in our heart, our motives. Then shall every man have praise of God. Once it's all revealed from our hearts, then we have praise from God. So, we first get to heaven. By the way, let's go to Revelation 22, 12. I want to show you how soon, apparently, according to the scriptures, this judgment seat of Christ takes place. 
Jesus comes back for his saints, and in Revelation 22, 12, he says, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. So apparently, the day of judgment seat of Christ is right away when Jesus comes back. The Bema seat is set up and will be judged again, as that verse says, for our works, the works we've done. So are we doing good works for the Lord or are we not? We need to evaluate that tonight. Once all the judgment seat of Christ is completed in heaven, and I don't know how long that will take. There is seven years going on here on earth during the time that we're in heaven for the judgment seat of Christ and marriage of the Lamb. But of course, God can do things quickly, however fast he wants. Uh, so I'm sure he's going to get through all the saints in heaven and they receive their reward before the end of the tribulation time on earth. And the reason for that is we come back with the Lord to end the battle of Armageddon, set up the kingdom age, which we'll be studying later. But after the judgment seat is finished in heaven, then it appears we have what's called the marriage of the Lamb. Turn to Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter number 19. Real quickly, in Revelation chapter 6 up to 19, we have all the events. We'll be looking at many of those chapters in the weeks to come. The events here on earth called the tribulation time. We'll be studying that. But here we find a scene in heaven once again in chapter number 19. A lot of honor and glory and hallelujahs being given to God there in the first six verses. But notice verse number 7 through 9. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Now in verses 11 and following, we find the battle of Armageddon and Jesus coming back with all of us to end it. So, this has to be taking place in heaven before we come back, which on our chart up here, we still have the chart up here, you see the return of Christ on this side with church age believers to the earth for all the things listed up there. So, the marriage of Christ has to take place before that here, and therefore it must be in heaven right after the judgment seat of Christ. Now you say, what exactly is the marriage of the Lamb? What, what's going on here? Well, turn, if you will, to the book of Ephesians, chapter 5. In Ephesians 5, we have the Apostle Paul teaching about marriage. And he says marriage is a picture of Christ and the church. Let's begin reading in verse number 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. He's the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ... So let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Now see, the husbands are compared to Christ. The church is compared to the wife in this passage. And we see how there's to be love back and forth. Now look at verse 26. Here it says that he might sanctify and cleanse it, talking about the church with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So here's Christ looking forward to being married, so to speak, to his church. Going back to Revelation chapter number 19. Notice the wife of the lamb mentioned here, the lamb being Jesus, is arrayed in fine linen, and it says the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. So the wife pictured here in Revelation has to be church saints. And as Ephesians points out, the Lord's looking forward to presenting us to himself as a glorious church 
in a special ceremony. Now, this, of course, marriage ceremony in heaven is not exactly like a marriage ceremony here and husband and wife. The whole point of it is showing that we are united to Christ forever and ever. In other words, wherever he is, whatever he does, whatever he wants us to do, we're always involved with the Lord Jesus Christ. We live in his city, the heavenly New Jerusalem. We'll see this later on. What's the light of that city? Jesus is. There's no sun or moon or stars, the Bible says in Revelation 21 there. Jesus is the light of the city. His glory just lights it. And so we're right there with him. Wherever he is, we're with him. He comes back to the Armageddon, we're here. He rules and reigns on this earth, we're with him. We'll see all that in the future. So the ceremony is to officially unite the Lord Jesus Christ and us as being together all one in the Lord. Unbelievable he would do that. You know, the Bible says these tremendous things in Romans 8, that we are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. In other words, all he inherits and all he's going to reign over, we're right there with him. Now, I cannot imagine how the Lord's doing such wonderful things for me. I certainly don't deserve it. But my, he's doing unspeakable things for us. He's giving us an inheritance. 1 Peter chapter 1 says, that is undefiled and fadeth not away. It goes on forever and ever and ever. You can't use up the inheritance Jesus gives you. In this life, you get inheritance from your family, you use it up. <laughs> but not in heaven. It never goes away, the inheritance God gives you. It's amazing to think of some of these things. It, it actually goes back to 1 Corinthians 2, 9. I hath not seen, ear hath not heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things that God hath prepared for them that love him. We can't even imagine sitting here tonight how great it is to be up there in heaven with Jesus. It's beyond our wildest imagination. But folk, it all comes back to him. And we're going to be united to him in the spatial marriage of the Lamb. Let's look at a couple other verses I meant to give you here. 2 Corinthians chapter number 11, Paul mentions how we are a spouse like a fiancé to the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 11 verse 2. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy... For I have espoused you to one husband, that I might present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. In other words, the relationship again there. I'm working on you, Corinthians. I want you to be right with the Lord. I want you to live the proper kind of life because you're going to be presented to the Lord. So there's another verse. Look at Romans. Go back a little bit further. Romans chapter 7. This terminology is used once again. Romans 7 and verse number 4. Wherefore, my brethren, you also become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Well, who is it that's raised from the dead? The Lord Jesus Christ. So we should be married to him, it says in that verse of Scripture. What a wonderful thought that is. So, up in heaven, after the rapture, we go to the judgment seat of Christ. All Christians are there. It's not a matter of you being judged whether you're going to heaven or hell. That decision's made in this life. Anyone who dies in the Bible either goes to heaven or goes to hell. Remember the story of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke 16? We find Lazarus died first and went to paradise. We find that the rich man died and went where? In, in hell, he lifted up his eyes being in torments. So when you leave this life, you're either going to heaven or going to hell. These judgments we're studying do not determine whether you go to heaven or hell. It's a judgment for the works of Christians, the judgment seat of Christ. Some people say, well, I'm just going to be glad to get to heaven. I, it doesn't matter how I live then. As long as I got my free ticket to heaven, I'm okay. Oh, it does matter how you live. Can you imagine standing before Jesus and millions of Christians 
and having all the things you did in this life just disappear and your life is worthless? How are you going to feel? Do you know Revelation 21, when the new heavens and new earth are created? That's when the Bible says tears are wiped away. I think there's going to be a lot of tears shed at the judgment seat of Christ by people who did not live for the Lord Jesus Christ. If they're even there. Now that's the big question when people say something like, well, as long as I got a free ticket to heaven, it doesn't matter how I live. They better read and wake up what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, shouldn't they, in verse 21 to 23? Because there are people who preached, people who have cast out demons, people who have done many wonderful works, and Jesus says to that group, depart from me, I never knew you. So when you're standing up and say, huh, I prayed a prayer and I got Jesus in my life and I'm going to heaven and I can live like I want, Woo! I'd be scared to death to say something like that. Salvation does more than that, give you a free ticket to heaven. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passing away. All things are becoming new. A person ought to be changed who trusts Christ as Savior. Doesn't mean they're perfect. Doesn't mean they won't battle sin. But they'll certainly have some changes in their life taking place. That's what scripture teaches. So anyway, judgment seat of Christ and the marriage of the Lamb. Any questions about that tonight? What takes place in heaven when we get there, wow, I must have covered it so well or you're in the fog so deep that you <laughs> can't see your way out. Yes, Terry. Um, up here on the chart, if you can see at the top, the first thing apparently from what we read, Jesus said, behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to reward everyone. So the first thing would be the judgment seat up here. Once that's completed, then there's this ceremony in heaven to be the marriage of the church to Christ. It takes place right after the judgment seat prior to us coming back with Christ to end the battle of Armageddon and set up his kingdom. We'll look at those events down the road. Does that help you? Okay. Two things in heaven. Now we're going to move on to the things on earth. Once Christians are taken out, and by the way, people try to imagine what would it be like when Christians just disappear? What if you've got a Christian flying an airplane? What's going to happen to Christians driving on the interstate and they're gone and their vehicles are still running? Well, all we can do is conjecture that there's going to be a lot of disasters around the world. And, of course, when that happens, there's going to have to be an explanation. You know, more and more of the world is hating and can't stand Christianity. They can get rid of Bible-believing Christians. They think that this world will be better. <laughs> so, personally, I think coming out of all that, disasters will be the Antichrist coming on the scene, rallying people. The Bible says he fools people with a lie. So remember, he can work wonders and all, miracles. So I think things will happen miraculously that people say, oh, praise, this is wonderful. All these people that held us back from living the way we want and doing what we want are gone. Yeah. We can live like we want. So somehow that's going to come together. It's going to come together. And they'll be happy and they'll be rejoicing. I know for one thing in Revelation 11, when two witnesses are here trying to get people to turn to God, the two witnesses of Revelation 11, finally God allows them to be killed. It could be Elijah and Moses. It could be Elijah and Enoch. There's differences on opinion. But anyway, they're going to be killed and lay in the streets. And listen to this. The Bible says all the people in the whole world rejoice over them being dead. They leave their bodies in the streets and they're just rejoicing everywhere on, everywhere on earth that these men are dead, representatives of God. However, their rejoicing is short-lived because after three days, just like Jesus, 
they're coming back to life and ascending right up to heaven. I'd like to see the eyes of the people in that happens. But when you see their reaction to those men, righteous men being killed and leaving their bodies in the street and people rejoicing over them, I can see people rejoicing when Christians are taken out of this world. So anyway, we can only conjecture about some of that because the Bible doesn't really explain what will happen on earth when Christians are taken out, but there has to be some chaotic time to start with. All right, any other question or comment? We'll close here tonight. And we're going to go to events on earth now after the rapture. What happens on the earth after the rapture? We'll start studying next Wednesday night, Lord willing. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time for us to study about what's going to happen to us when we get to be in heaven with you. Lord, the marriage, the judgment seat of Christ is going to be there. We're going to be rewarded or lose rewards for what we have done for you in this life here below. That's why it's so important for us to die to self, take up our cross, and follow you each day. There's going to be eternal reward for that that we'll enjoy forever and ever. But if we just forfeit that for living for here and now and we truly are saved, we'll be saved as it said there in 1 Corinthians 3, but all of our works will be burned up and we just made it there. How sad to be in that boat. Encourage us from this lesson tonight, Lord, to be bringing forth good works to you. Then, Lord, we look forward to that marriage of the Lamb with Christ and uh, what a time that'll be to be united as a church to Him and forever being one with Him and all that He enjoys and has in heaven and on earth will be a part of that unbelievable, Lord. Beyond our comprehension, we don't deserve it. We can just fall on our faces and praise you and thank you for what you're going to do for us. Now, Lord, bless us as we go from here tonight. Give us a good remainder to this week. And as you tarry, we look forward to Father's Day and honoring fathers here below, but mainly, number one, honoring our Heavenly Father above. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You're dismissed tonight. God bless you.